A little bit. Just a little bit. Yes. All the good stuff. <laughs> Can you hear me? Okay. Good, good. All right. Well, and, uh, I'm going to be talking about dopaminergic and opioid systems, and in the context of pain and uh, opioid analgesia. Um, I call, I'm coming from Michigan uh, via Bilbao, Spain, for those who are from this area. I'm originally from Bilbao and uh, uh, migrated to do some research up in the United States, where I've been for the last uh, while. <laughs> anyway. Um, so we know that substance abuse uh, is complex, right? I mean, you have environmental factors. Uh, you know, you have the environment that is affecting the capacity or the responses to, to drugs of abuse. Uh, there is a genetic susceptibility. We know that uh, probably the genetic uh, influence on uh, substance use behaviors is probably about 50% ballpark. Um, there are specific uh, risk conferring behaviors, individuals who may be more impulsive, more reward seeking, uh, who then may be uh, early experimenting. So there are a number of different lines of research along these lines in the lab, but I'm going to be concentrating primarily on the idea of opioid dependence and the complexity of this particular problem. Um, this uh, just show uh, the increase in opioid prescriptions in the United States is become uh, kind of an epidemic uh, since the, um, and it was kind of a paradoxical epidemi epidemic in some ways. Uh, in the 1970s and 80s, it was recognized that pain oftentimes went untreated or not very well treated. So there was this push towards uh, complete treatment of pain, calling pain the sixth vital sign, and of course the companies you know, took great advantage of this and introduced a number of new compounds for pain, including opiates, uh, which have become um, highly prescribed in the United States across different uh, uh, medical specialties like dentistry, um, you know, family practice, and so on so forth. And this become kind of the easy way to treat uh, pain if you want. And of course, together with the increase in opioid prescriptions, uh, there is also an increase in the potential for addiction, uh, diversion of opioids, as well as death, um, uh, overdose deaths, uh, which now surpass those attributed to antidepressants, benzodiazepines, or even cocaine and heroin. I think what makes this problem particularly difficult and challenging is that opioids are used for the treatment of a medical condition. So therefore, if somebody comes in and is asking you for opiates and wants to take more opiates, you don't know if this is because they have more pain, because they have a pseudo addiction where they need the opioids to be able to function, or whether they actually have an addiction. And this is further complicated because uh, there seems to be a tremendous inter-individual variation in the target systems that the opioids work, uh, namely dopamine and the opioid uh, receptors and neurotransmitter systems among healthy individuals and in patients diagnosed with chronic pain conditions. And that's kind of what I'm going to be talking today about. Uh, inter-individual variation in the function of these systems and the potential implications from the perspective of response to uh, opioid analgesics. So we've gone about this with uh, positron emission tomography. Well, I particularly like positron emission tomography because it gives you a specific targets. Uh, many of you have seen or have worked in the area of functional magnetic resonance imaging, which gives you a signal, but it's fairly non-specific. We still utilize positron emission tomography with the specific targets to measure receptors, to stimulate release of neurotransmitters, it changes in receptor sites, and so forth. And it therefore gives you probably a better translation from the animal research world into the, uh, the human arena. So uh, in this case, you are seeing images of uh, acquired after the administration of a new opioid receptor um, radio tracer called carbon-11 carfentanil, which is the only available mu opioid selective radio tracer that we have right now. Um, although I'll be telling you about others as well. So when you introduce the radio tracer uh, intravenously, it becomes distributed in a manner proportional to blood flow. Over time, the radio tracer uh, gets bound to a specific receptor sites, in this case, mu opioid receptors, 
So areas such as the occipital cortex become dark, areas such as the basal ganglia thalamus cortex become brighter, meaning that you have more, you know, more tracer um, available there. And then we take all this information and we then uh, we obtain on a voxel by voxel basis maps of uh, receptor availability. We typically use the measurement called binding potential, which is the ratio of the concentration of receptors divided by the affinity. That's one of the better measures you can get in vivo with a single administration of radio tracer. Um, and then we utilize these maps to um, co-register with anatomical data, typically magnetic resonance imaging. Then you can non-linearly standardize, put everything into the same stereotactic coordinate system, which then allows you to calculate uh, statistics directly on the images. So you literally end up doing statistics on a 3D volume uh, between subjects, within subjects, depending on what the experimental paradigm may be. So when we do these measurements at baseline, what you have is a certain amount of endogenous, um, endogenous ligand say dopamine or endogenous opioids, um, you then have uh, the tracer binding to the, to the receptors and some competition between the two. So at baseline, you have a given uh, signal. If you were to induce a change, which you know, basically increase the release of this endogenous ligand, you will have more of the endogenous ligand available in the synapse, less of the tracer available to bind to the receptor sites, to the free, tracer, uh, to the free uh, receptor sites, and therefore, this would be um, measured as activation. You're activating the system, and your signal goes down. You have less tracer binding to the receptor sites. So this change from baseline to the activated state, it gives you an indirect measure of neurotransmitter release. And that's how we typically do the experiments. You do like a baseline experiment. You get your baseline measurements of receptor sites, and then you stimulate or change something, and therefore, that reduction in signal reflects activation. Sometimes we see the opposite, which is deactivation, which is less uh, <coughs> endogenous ligand in the synapse, more tracer is available to bind, more receptors are available to, to bind the tracer, and the signal goes up. That would be a measure of deactivation. So it kind of goes in the opposite direction as, you know, bold imaging or fMRI, functional MRI imaging. So let's start with mu opioid receptor mediated neurotransmission. Why are we interested in looking at this? Well, first of all, we know that this involves in endogenous opioid analgesia and the effect of opioid analgesics. Um, it's also in, uh, involved in stress responses and stress-induced analgesia. Famous stories about individuals being injured in battle, and then these individuals don't feel any pain, they go back, and then they, they feel the pain, they realize they are wounded. So that's stress-induced analgesia. And it's also very much involved in things like social behavior, affiliative behavior, social behavior, bonding between the dams and the pups, um, regulates responses to salient stimuli, including appetitive stimuli, and is thought to confer the hedonic value of natural, uh, uh, natural rewards like food, uh, but also drugs of abuse. Um, and it's thought to mediate placebo effects during expectation of algesia. Actually, I will not be talking about that. That's another line of work in the lab. But the opioid system does not work in isolation, and there are strong connections between dopaminergic and opioid systems throughout the brain. Those are well known in the ventral tegmental area, where mu opioid receptors uh, through GABA interneurons regulate the function of dopaminergic cells. Um, in the nucleus accumbens, there are also strong connections whereby dopamine D2 receptors actually activate opioidergic cells, encephalinergic cells, that go from the nucleus accumbens to the ventral pallidum, which is a critical area involved in uh, reward, involved in uh, place preference, and the effects of drugs of abuse. In fact, the opioid system, in addition to dopamine, has been associated with appetitive behavior, the liking for drugs of abuse, the liking for um, for food and natural rewards. And in, in, in um, chronic drug administration, uh, we actually see that the chronic administration of dopaminergic agonists or indirect agonists like cocaine actually changes opioid function. So for example, when you administer cocaine chronically, there is a reduction in, um, in, in, in um, uh, endogenous opioid peptides such as encephaline in the basal ganglia and in terminal regions like, uh, like the ventral pallidal region while the opioid receptors with cocaine go up. So the two seem to go together. If you have a reduction in the content of endogenous opioid peptides, you have a mu opioid receptor upregulation, 
uh, probably compensatory and vice versa. And this can be modulated through dopamine, uh, primarily through dopamine D2 receptors. Um, we also know that when you administer cocaine chronically and in humans, you see an upregulation of new receptors throughout the brain, which is directly correlated in some areas with cocaine craving and similar effects, although a little bit less clear because it's more complicated. Um, we also see that with nicotine in chronic smokers. So we began looking at this um, using the model of pain. So the idea was to try to understand a little bit about pain, how pain is inter-individually variable, how it's being modulated by these neurotransmitter systems, and how this relates to the propensity to uh, uh, develop uh, addictions and the effects of drugs of abuse. So for that, we use um, an interesting model. You may like this one, uh, where uh, this was developed by a dentist. And you take a needle, uh, you attach it to hypertonic saline, you introduce it into the masseter muscle, and then you induce pain through hypertonic saline, 5% saline. So it's a pain challenge. We utilize this for about 20 minutes. It's very safe, actually. It's very small quantities of um, hypertonic saline, which then we compare the response of the organism to that of isotonic saline, which doesn't cause pain. It looks pretty gruesome, but it's actually not that bad. And it's very well tolerated. And the way we do this is, we actually ask the volunteers to rate pain every 15 seconds with a visual analog scale in front of them. These ratings go to a computer controller, which then changes the infusion to maintain pain at a target level. We usually maintain pain at about 40 in a scale of 0 to 100, which is pretty mild. I mean, it's not mild, but it's tolerable. Uh, and last for about, we usually go for about 20 to 30 minutes. So the idea is twofold. First of all, have enough time so you can quantify receptors and changes in receptor availability in the human brain. And number two is that when pain becomes more sustained, it's no longer just a warning signal, but it becomes a lot more like a stressor, a form of physical and emotional stress that impacts both um, the ratings of pain, but also the emotional state of the volunteers. Um, this, and this is basically how this looks like. So the visual analog scale of uh, pain intensity is relatively constant over time. There are some fluctuations, but we maintain it at about 35 to 40 uh, throughout the study. And then the infusion rate actually changes automatically, so pain is maintained constant. The other thing we achieve with this model is that everybody has the same experience of pain. Everybody has different pain thresholds. So while you, know, you may rate pain at you know, 50, and I may rate it at 50, for the same amount of you know, pain challenge. So this way, everybody experiences the same. Um, uh, it's, it's matched by the experience of this particular sti stimulus, and everybody has the same uh, level of pain uh, report. So when you do this type of studies, then the few things that happened was, well, we do the challenge, we compare with control condition, and two things were the first things that we saw. There was tremendous inter-individual variability. You do this challenge, everybody has the same level of pain, and at baseline, though, during the non-painful condition, the isotonic saline, first of all, you see tremendous inter-individual variation in um, new opioid receptor availability. Some people had a low binding, uh, a lot of people had, some people had very low binding. Why? We don't know. And then when you do the challenge, then some people release a lot, so you have a decline in the signal, like that one, for example, and others very little. So there is tremendous inter-individual variation both at the receptor level and also at the capacity to release endogenous opioids in response to, to a standardized stimulus. The interesting part about that is that this had physiological significance. The magnitude of release of endogenous opioids for a particular stimulus was linearly correlated to the sensory characteristics of pain. This was measured with the McGill pain questionnaire, which basically tells you about um, uses word descriptors that uh, give you the characteristics of pain, the severity and characteristics of the sensory quality of the pain. So the more the release of endogenous opioids in areas such as the ventral basal ganglia, the thalamus, the amygdala, um, uh, the more the release of endogenous opioids, the less the pain ratings by the volunteers. So the release of opioids activated in myopia receptors uh, the, uh, reduce the pain experience in these individuals. In other areas, it was associated with the affective quality of pain or the, or the unpleasantness of pain, which is the, uh, the affective quality, the emotional quality of the pain signal. And that in included the medial thalamus, some areas of the dorsal anterior cingulate. And yet in other areas, such as the nucleus accumbens, it was associated, it was negatively correlated with the negative affect 
that the subjects experience as measured with a positive and ne negative affectivity scale, which has nothing to do with pain, is how you feel internally in terms of your own emotional state. So depending on where you are releasing these endogenous opioids in the brain, you are able to suppress multiple elements of this pain stress experience, right? Okay. So the other thing that we did do was the obvious one, which was looking at sex differences. Um, there is uh, evidence that some uh, persistent pain conditions are actually more frequent in women than in men. And uh, so what do you think? Do you think that women are more sensitive or more uh, tolerant to pain than men? You think? Okay. All right. So when we, <laughs> so when we did the studies, we always do the studies. Depends on the pain. Yes, it does depend on the pain. There are very few sex differences for brief pain, for basic brief pain. Differences actually do emerge when you look at more sustained pain. And so the way we did the study is we, we studied women in the follicular phase of the menstrual cycle. And in the follicular phase, as you know, you have low estradiol, low progesterone. So we were running estradiol levels of about 20 to 60 picograms per ml ballpark in the range. And during that phase of the menstrual cycle, uh, there were actually significant sex differences, both in the pain report and in the capacity to release these endogenous opioids, where women at these low estradiol levels release less endogenous opioids than men did in areas such as the thalamus, the nucleus accumbens, and the amygdala, which are involved in things like reward, responses to salient stimuli, and pain regulation. So there were tremendous sex differences. But what was very cute about this is that if you bring these women back and you increase the levels of estradiol artificially, we use patches, and we, uh, or estradiol patches, and we raise estradiol plasma levels to about 200 picograms per ml, which is kind of periovulatory levels, still physiological. And uh, under those conditions with high estradiol, women actually release about the same or more of these endogenous opioids than men did, and in fact, suppress the pain more effectively. So it's not that women are more or less sensitive to pain, to sustain pain, it's that they are more complicated. We kind of knew that, right? Okay. Sorry. <laughs> it was kind of a joke. Ah, uh, well, you grow boobs. <laughs> not a good idea. <laughs> Testosterone also seems to have some effects, although we haven't looked that much. Progesterone doesn't seem to have the same, the same effects. We don't see nearly as much. But if you think what this means is that women during, for example, pregnancy, have levels of estradiol in the thousands of picograms per ml, and uh, levels of, of progesterone also in the thousands. So basically, uh, the women's organism is able to better adapt to pain depending on the uh, circumstances and the requirements of the organism. So it's uh, more adaptable, if you want. How's that? <laughs> so anyway, so how does this relate to things that relate to drug abuse. Well, we looked at this using um, trait. Uh, so we basically were looking for things that would explain all these variants that we were seeing in responses of these neurotransmitter systems, particularly the endogenous opioid system. And one of them that we looked at was impulsiveness. The, that's the neo-personality inventory impulsiveness uh, subscale of the neuroticism subscale. And this one particularly maps into um, uh, urgency or acting without thinking. So it has been related to risk for drug abuse, uh, risk for um, uh, opioid dependence, and various uh, alcoholism, including uh, as well. So what we saw was that if you were to look at baseline neopioid receptor availability, and you look at people who are in the upper 50th percentile, in the upper 50th uh, percentile of impulsiveness by the neo, it's a trait impulsiveness. Um, these are all men. So men who were, um, the more the myopic receptor binding, the more the impulsiveness scores. And the opposite, the orthogonal dimension, which is the liberation, the more the, um, the, the, more the binding, the less the deliberation, and vice versa. Uh, so basically, there were differences based on impuls impulsiveness and deliberation in areas such as the dorsal cingulate, ventral pallidum, nucleus accumbens, and amygdala in areas involved in motivated behavior, seeking drugs of abuse, and so forth. When we do the pain challenge, and we call it a stress, pain stress induced release, the individuals who also were more impulsive were also releasing more of these endogenous opioids in a manner proportional to impulsiveness scores and in the opposite compared to deliberation. So individuals who were more impulsive had more binding, 
And in response to a stressor, we're also able to release more of these endogenous opioids, which probably is telling you that these individuals, even under stress conditions, may actually acquire some degree of reward or liking of this you know, particular um, stress environment, which may actually be also associated with um, things like seeking drugs of abuse, et cetera, et cetera. So we actually looked at uh, then the phenotypes. We looked at individuals that would be at high risk for drug use, and this would be the high impulsive low deliberation, or um, the individuals that would be intermediate for both traits, and those that would be low impulsiveness, high deliberation, who would be uh, at the least risk for, uh, say, experimenting with drugs and getting in trouble and so forth. And what we saw was that there was a linear relationship between these traits where individuals who were at high risk had more binding and more release in response to stress. Uh, individuals who were intermediate were intermediate for both. And the low impulsiveness, high deliberation, had low baseline and low release of endogenous opioids in response to a stressor. So again, talking about uh, looking at this inter-individual variation. Interestingly enough, when we looked at a particular disorder, borderline personality disorder, um, this is actually a, a, a personality disorder that has been associated with very high levels of comorbidity, with substance abuse, uh, presence with irritability, difficulties in interpersonal relationships. And these individuals, when we looked at baseline, they also demonstrated in most brain regions a large increases in myopia receptor availability in areas such as the orbitofrontal cortex, the amygdala, nucleus accumbens, caudate nucleus. And when you uh, apply a challenge, in this case we did a different challenge, um, the one you are seeing here is a sadness induction where we ask them to experience a state of sadness for about half an hour. We've done it with pain too and the results are similar. And um, individuals with borderline personality disorder, the same as the impulsiveness individuals, also release a lot of these, more of these endogenous opioids in response to um, a releasing a stimulus, in this case sadness induction in the cingulate, or with the frontal cortex, ventral pallidal region, and the amygdala. All right, so we talked about endogenous opioids a little bit, we explored a little bit uh, about the, we explored a little bit the inter-individual variation. I will talk about genetics in a few minutes. But the other element of this, and I told you that there was a fair amount of connection between dopaminergic and opioid systems, is actually the dopaminergic systems. When we think about dopamine and we think about drugs of abuse, we typically think that dopamine responds to reward, right? If you think dopamine, you think reward. Not really. Uh, dopamine responds to salient stimuli, things that are salient to the organism. It also responds to stress. And in fact, there is evidence that a stress-induced dopamine release may induce um, 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 the craving for drugs of abuse and reinstatement of uh, dro uh, drug taking in animal models and, and in humans. So we did the same challenge, we did the pain challenge, sustained pain challenge, and we looked at, you know, is this affecting dopamine release? And yes, it did. If you look at the overall effect, which is baseline against pain, uh, we saw release of dopamine everywhere in the basal ganglia, dorsal caudate, putamen, uh, nucleus accumbens region, but then we looked at the specific elements <coughs> of the pain experience. So there is a specific pain uh, experience which relates to the subtraction between pain minus the saline control. During the saline control condition, people don't experience pain, but they rate it. So you are controlling for non-specific elements of the experience, only the pain signal. And we just look at the pain signal and the subtraction of saline control and pain the uh, hypertonic saline, we see release of dopamine in the dorsal regions of the caudate and the uh, putamen, which actually receive input from somatosensory cortex. And in those areas, there was a positive relationship between dopamine release and the sensory uh, aspects of pain, McGill pain questionnaire sensory scores, VAS pain intensity scores in these regions, high, high levels of correlation between the two. Well, if you look at the non-specific element of the experience, which is subtracting out, so if you take the overall effect and then you subtract out the effect of saline control, when you look at this would be more like an anticipatory component. Uh, this anticipatory component, which is not necessarily related to pain, um, was associated with the release of dopamine in the ventral basal ganglia. This would be the non-specific response to a stimulus, meaning not painful stimulus. The effect was seen in the nucleus accumbens, and it was exclusively associated with uh, the PANAS, which is positive and negative affectivity scale, negative affective scores. 
and fear scores uh, in this area. So it had nothing to do with pain, but it had to do with anticipatory components, saliency components of pain associated with nucleus accumbens, dopamine release under this stimulus. All right, so now let's talk about, I told you about dopamine and opioid mechanisms. In, yeah. Same, well, it's D2 activation. So basically when I say D2 activation is because we measure dopamine D2 and D3 receptors with raclopride. So in terms of the release, you might have a different differential uh, effect because uh, high concentration of dopamine would affect different receptors, right? Right. I mean, it would both, I mean, D2 both. and D1. But, but in this area, you don't have D1 receptors. This radio tracer um, only binds to dopamine D2, D3 receptors in the basal ganglia. Uh, you have D1 in the basal ganglia, this one doesn't bind D1, but you're right, you could have D1 uh, binding, we don't measure it here. This was done, I didn't tell you that, but this was measured with carbon-11 raclopride, which is a selective agent for dopamine D2, and in the nucleus accumbens also labels D3 receptors. So we only measure, that's why I call it dopamine D2, D3 neurotransmission, because yes, you do have dopamine release, but in this case we are only measuring the release that is binding, dopamine that is binding and changing, uh, the function of dopamine D3 and D2, because that's what the that's what the tracer labels. So, yeah. Uh huh. They compete for the same receptors. The concentration of the tracer is very very low. Is that's why it's called tracer. So it's given, for example, with carfentanil, we use 0 0.03 micrograms per kilogram which is about 1.3 micrograms per body weight for a normal body weight person. Uh, for the antagonist raclopride, we go up to 50 micrograms total volume. So that occupies less than about 0.5-0.6% of the receptors available. So it's not like a saturation assay that you would do in binding in the in vitro. It's actually a tracer assay, meaning you only label a very small amount, a very small proportion of receptors. Mm -hmm. that's the, and that's important because if you don't do that, you actually change synaptic activity. If you were to bind to too many receptors, you would block dopamine transmission completely or opioid transmission completely and that changes physiology. The whole thing just breaks down. Then you only measure the receptors? Yeah, exactly. So you measure it before at baseline, you measure it after the challenge. Doses of carfentanil that mm -hmm. you're using, I guess you don't have any pharmacological effect. No. Mm -hmm. No, if you are at about up to about 0.05 micrograms per kilogram, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes in very uh, sensitive individuals, like young women, tend, because they do have more binding, young women tend to experience more side effects if you go abo above 0.05 micrograms per kilogram. If you, and we keep it at 0.03, so just to make sure we have nothing. We've looked at pu pupillary dilation, sedation. Uh, the first thing you tend to see is nausea, you want to see anything, so, okay. So now this is the first time we actually looked at uh, common genetic polymorphisms and how they affected the function of the system. This one was looking at the common genetic variant, which is the enzyme catechol orthomethyl transferase. Um, is a valine to methionine variation in codon 158. And this is associated with a poorer function of this particular enzyme. And the logic of this study was, well, if you actually metabolize dopamine more poorly, you'll have more dopamine in the synapse, and there will be, uh, le you will eventually deplete uh, the, uh, the endogenous uh, opioids, and you will upregulate myopia receptors in a manner similar to what has been shown uh, with, you know, when you give D2 agonists, uh, or psychostimulant administration, uh, that's actually the kind of effect that you see. So the metallil, which is the less functional allele, uh, we speculated would be associated with upregulation and binding and reduction in the functionality of the endogenous opioid system. And, and therefore, this would be associated with poor capacity to control pain. And the opposite would be happening if you had less dopamine around, if you had a valalil, which metabolizes dopamine uh, and norepinephrine more effectively. And this would be models like 6 hydroxydopamine administration or chronic D2 antagonist administration. You expect an increase in encephaline mRNA, more encephaline around, and reductions in binding, but more capacity to release. And of course, that's exactly what we saw 
whereby if you were to look at the metallil, which is the less functional form of the enzyme, met met homozygous, this actually e had increased binding, but less capacity to release endogenous opioids, uh, intermediate for heterozygotes, and the opposite effect for the val-val. Um, the val-val allele, the vals, uh, have actually been associated, not unlike what we saw with the impulsive mistrate, with polysubstance abuse, actually, in uh, some studies. So, and the more the release of these endogenous opioids uh, by the valval, the more the capacity to release, uh, the release opioids and the better the suppression of pain among these individuals, uh, as well as the suppression of negative affect, which I'm not showing you the data here. So, so wait, wait, wait. Yeah. I'm, I'm confused. You're confused. Okay, so if you have more dopamine, yep. you have more, in, more activation B2. Yes. Which is Eventually. That's where the encephalon is in this, in this co mm -hmm. with D2. Right. So you have less release of D2, uh, less release of the encephalon if you have more dopamine Acute. release of D2. Actually, no. Um, D2 receptors in encephalinergic neurons in the accumbens will release encephalin. How does that work? I think it's the GABA interneurons. How does that work? GABA interneurons. Yeah. So it's interneurons. So you're activating. So it's dopamine to GABA to new. But the directly, the dopamine is going to inhibit. Yes, directly dopamine will inhibit. But the chronic administration, the... So it should, shouldn't be anything to do with your, your COMT, that's what I'm going to say. The hmm. dopamine should activate, should inactivate the D2 containing neurons. Right. So, and they also can contain the capital. Mm -hmm. Yes, but that's right. That, no, I agree with you. But when this has been looked at in the animal model, yeah. okay, if you were to administer the venergic agonist directly, it will eventually deplete encephalinergic mRNA. It will go down over time in, in the accumbens, in the cell particularly, and in the ventral pallium. So it goes okay, down. So it must be a feedback system. It must be the feedback system. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. Not, it's not direct. No, it, it cannot be direct because yeah. you don't have, I mean, while you do have dopamine D2 cells, I mean, receptors in the opioid, in the encephalinergic cells, it's probably a feedback loop that is actually changing the, the function of the system. It's no, you're right. Yeah. I mean, I think or, or else it's inhibiting the release of dopamine because you've got mm -hmm. D2 or uh, presynaptic as well. You do. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, but that's... Very yeah. No, it is complicated because you do have regulation that is happening both at the VTA and as well as in yeah. the converse area. So, I mean, it is complex. But that's actually one thing that has been heavily replicated, actually, in terms of, you know, chronic administration of dopamine agonists depleting um, in cephalinergic cells, and not just in the accumbens, but also in terminal regions such as the prefrontal cortex, ventral, uh, ventral pallidal region, insular cortex as well. So, so there is, it's not just that loop, it's probably more related to the VTA loops actually. Yeah, so, yeah. But it is complicated. No. All right, um, another one we actually looked at uh, was neuropeptide Y. Why we were interested in this is because there is evidence that neuropeptide Y actually do some of their effects through opioid cells. Neuropeptide Y became interesting uh, as, uh, when uh, people were studying resiliency to stress. And um, it was shown that individuals with low levels of neuropeptide Y in plasma, with high levels of neuropeptide Y in plasma, were much more able to, um, uh, were much more able to suppress the stress experience um, under you know, difficult conditions. This was specifically studied in, uh, in, the, in rangers, so these are the special forces um, in the US Army that um, went through combat training and so forth, and they looked at neuropeptide Y as one of the uh, mechanisms by which these individuals were much more able to um, uh, effectively go through the training and have a less negative experience. So in a collaboration with the intramural program, we looked at uh, aplotypes, meaning groups of genes that were associated with lesser or higher uh, secretion of neuropeptide Y. So we looked at diplotypes, uh, groups of aplotypes, which were associated with low uh, production of neuropeptide Y and high production of uh, neuropeptide Y as well as uh, intermediate, um, in intermediate groups. And one of the things that we saw was that the individuals that were, um, uh, that were less able to produce neuropeptide Y because of these variations 
in genetic function were individuals that actually responded, responded to um, fearful phases, to negative stimuli, uh, more so in the amygdala and hippocampal region. And also, when you looked at the pain challenge, that actually the individuals that had the low functioning forms of the neuropeptide Y gene were also less able to release endogenous opioids compared to the high function ones. The high function ones were also individuals that experienced less pain, less stress during these challenges. What was interesting to me about this particular series of studies is that we always struggle with the idea that the particular gene only explains a very small proportion of the variance uh, for a particular behavior. And what we were seeing is that neuropeptide Y expression accounted only for a very small proportion, 3 to 5 percent, of the behavioral measures that we were looking at, trade anxiety, emotion, pain ratings. But then explain almost 10 percent of the metabolic responses of, uh, to emotional stimuli. In this case, we were using fearful phases with functional MRI. But about 37 percent, almost 40 percent, of regional opioid system responses to the pain stressor. In other words, that for a single gene, uh, the relationship for a complex behavior is relatively small. The closer you come to the gene in terms of your measurement, whether it's the bold response, whether it's the functional response, or whether it's a receptor system function, actually the gene explains more and more of the variance. We then went on to look at you know, what this meant. We saw that individuals with the low function uh, aplotype <coughs> of the uh, neuropeptide Y gene were also more associated with the develop development of depression in, a, in an unmedicated depression sample. These are the only, uh, the individuals with low function genes also were the ones that had the least positive affect during the pain challenges, while the opposite was the case for the high function neuropeptide Y gene and fMRI brain responses to negative stimuli. This was a different probe uh, using simply uh, words with uh, negative, uh, negative balance was greater in individuals with the low neuropeptide Y gene. So this particular gene was giving a signal from the perspective of different responses to, stimuli, to emotional stimuli and also the capacity to respond to stress more effectively through the activation of the endogenous opioid system. And another element that we are now looking into <coughs> is the effect of inflammatory markers. So again, we are trying to explain variants, right? Um, neuro, uh, inflammatory mechanisms are becoming increasingly recognized as important in explaining predisposition to disease, chronic pain conditions, uh, depression, for example, and so forth. And in this case, we were looking at um, uh, IL-1 beta is uh, one of the families of pro-inflammatory cytokines and IL-1 receptor antagonist, which is uh, a, an anti-inflammatory counterpart of IL-1 beta. And what we're actually seeing is that, direct, and this is actually a replication of data in animal models that was done some years ago, where people were looking at um, IL-1 beta administration in the animal model and relationships with endogenous opioid system functions centrally, uh, which were localized in the amygdala, and we saw exactly the same in humans, where baseline levels of uh, IL-1 beta were um, negatively correlated with mu opioid receptor concentrations uh, highly localized in the amygdala uh, in humans, while the activation of IL-1 array, which is an anti-inflammatory is is an anti mechanism, was actually associated with the activation um, of endogenous opioids and mu opioid receptors in the nucleus accumbens uh, ventral basal ganglia region, suggesting that uh, inter-individual variation in inflammatory mechanisms is also affecting uh, variability in the function of these neurotransmitter systems and therefore um, affecting the capacity to respond to stress and or drugs of abuse more effectively. All right. So yeah. peripheral Yes, yeah, peripheral. peripheral. Okay. Yeah, just yeah. plasma levels. We can't access the head. Yeah, yeah. CSF. Yeah. Correlate, you know. yeah. They seem to be highly correlated, yeah. actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so I'm telling you all this story about inter-individual variation because it probably makes a difference in terms of um, probability to develop chronic pain syndromes, for example. And we looked at this for a couple of different uh, pain, uh, uh, pain states. One of them was fibromyalgia. As you know, fibromyalgia is an idiopathic con uh, pain condition uh, with persistent pain, muscular pain, uh, widespread. There is some association with uh, inflammatory mechanisms, uh, particularly IL-6, IL-1. Um, so here we looked at um, 
mu opioid receptors in individuals diagnosed with fibromyalgia. Now, years ago, people looked at this in neuropathic pain, arthritic pain, neuropathic pain, and they saw that using uh, tracers like carbon 11 diprenorphine, which is a non-selective opioid uh, radio tracer, labels mu, kappa, and delta. They saw profound reductions in opioid receptor availability in people who were suffering from chronic pain. So um, nobody had done this in fibromyalgia, so we looked, looked at it, and we did see uh, reductions in uh, mu opioid receptor availability in fibromyalgia, but in much more localized fashion. These were actually localized in the nucleus accumbens, in the amygdala, in the dorsal anterior cingulate, areas of the brain that are very much involved in pain responses, pain regulation, but also emotional responses, responses to salient stimuli, which may actually explain the high level of comorbidity between mood disturbances and emotion disturbances and pain in individuals diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And in fact, what we saw was <coughs> the more the reduction of these uh, myopia receptors in these regions, the more the pain report in these individuals. So the more the reduction of binding, the more the pain report um, in, these, uh, in these subjects. And we also saw that for these regions, areas such as the uh, insular cortex, uh, or the changes over time with treatment in opioid receptors, that these were actually related to the functional MRI bold responses. So this is the blood level oxygenation signal uh, that you measure with functional MRI. So what we saw was that the less the myopia receptors or the less the change in myopia receptors over time with treatment, the more the ball responds to painful stimuli in these patients, suggesting that um, the activation of the uh, brain regions in response to pain is heavily dependent on the capacity to activate myopia receptors in patients with chronic pain. At least for these regions, in areas that were anti nociceptive we actually saw different effects opposite effects in the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex, but at least in the uh, insular cortex, amygdala, uh, which are areas that are um, pronociceptive uh, or involved in the pain suppression through myopia receptors, there was this inverse relationship between binding and the bulb response to, um, to pain. So, yeah. We can't tell. I mean, the problem, that's the problem, yeah. is that we, when you measure receptor availability, two things may be going on if you just measure it at baseline, right? Mm -hmm. you, in theory, because you have relatively low tone in healthy controls, mm -hmm. the tone of the opioid system is very low at baseline. There are some areas with tone, like the accumbens, like the amygdala, there is certain tone there, some areas of the prefrontal cortex. But the tone tends to be generally low. So we typically say at baseline, most of the time, under normal circumstances, you would expect that is associated with receptor concentrations. I mean, that's, but it could be more release. You have a lot of release, and you know, the myopia receptors are actually down. That's why we do experiments with both baseline and release, so you have a more, a better measurement of the capacity to activate the system. Exactly. So you're using the cytotonic Yeah, in this case. Yeah, pretty much. Or, or other stimuli. We've done it with other, you know, things, like social stress and stuff like that. But which is rather cute, actually. <laughs> but um, um, this one actually is an example. You know, so we measure these receptors, I mean, you know, who cares? Well, part of this study uh, involved uh, doing acupuncture, OK? So these are patients with fibromyalgia. Um, they enrolled in the study. And we did um, three acupuncture trials per week for four weeks. And the idea was that, well, there is this long story or this long uh, believe that acupuncture actually changes the function of the endogenous opioid system, and that's why it actually induces uh, pain control in patients who go through acupuncture. So we did the study. Um, I actually thought that acupuncture was going to be a placebo, so uh, we were studying placebo, so that was kind of my original thinking. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, we actually looked at uh, true Chinese acupuncture, verum acupuncture, versus some acupuncture in, in these patients diagnosed with fibromyalgia. And what was interesting about this particular part of the study is that everybody had the same effect. So individuals that went through some acupuncture had the same clinic. This was done in 20 patients. 
It had the same um, uh, clinical effect that those who receive traditional uh, Chinese acupuncture. So the clinical effect was exactly the same. It was completely indistinguishable. Both groups did better than a natural history group, which was treated as usual, which is rather interesting. But when you actually look at the brain, the effects of SAM and traditional Chinese acupuncture were completely different. The ones with SAM in black, uh, basically we didn't see much of a change in myopia receptor availability with SAM acupuncture. Maybe some release in some areas, meaning some reduction in the availability of receptors acutely after SAM, which you know, we interpret as release of endogenous opioids. But what was very interesting about this is that individuals that receive the true Chinese acupuncture saw a large increase in myopia receptor availability, meaning a restoration of receptor binding throughout many brain regions, uh, which was rather puzzling. So while the clinical effect of SAM and true Chinese acupuncture, traditional Chinese acupuncture, was indistinguishable from each other, the biological effect of the two was actually in completely opposite directions which was rather interesting. Uh, this was actually rather puzzling. Uh, so we actually went back again to the literature and we actually did find, back in the 1980s, a study done in the animal model where the, they did in vitro binding. So this was done in vitro with classic myopia receptor. Uh, you know, I don't remember the, the trace, the, the binding assay, but uh, just do, doing binding in vitro. And they saw that in rats with electroacupuncture, there was a very fast and large increase in the membrane-bound uh, myopia receptors. So there's something about traditional Chinese acupuncture that was actually changing the availability of receptors in the membrane, which we saw here in this in vivo assay. We are following up on this one. So John, does this yeah. mean that there's no point in looking at biological markers? No, there is the point is that we have to look at biological markers because the clinical markers don't tell us anything. So the clinical and markers. Yeah, but the mechanisms may actually be different, right? Yeah. So, for example, uh, these individuals may actually respond better to opiates, for example. They have more binding yeah. and lower doses. So, or to compounds that may affect the endogenous opioid system. So it, it tells you that in reality, our clinical markers are really not very good. And we cannot know that. I mean, we know that for, <coughs> for things like pain, which is a subjective experience. We know that for most psychiatric disorders where you have a subjective report but not objective report. So we need to have objective markers. That's why I call this you know, utility of biomarkers in clinical trials because you know, many clinical trials fail because your, out, your endpoint is very subjective. And I think. So basically, the whole group of patients don't review. Yeah. So in one case, you have a relevant biological marker, which mm -hmm. is the view of the Well, actually, you, you, that's, you cannot do, actually. There was evidence, and in fact, we did see, and we are following up on that, that when you do the SAM, you do see release of endogenous opioids in a number of areas. So the mechanism was different. It's a placebo-like effect. So um, placebos release endogenous opioids. We know that, and I can tell you more about that if you want. So the, there are two different effects, one of, one of release and one of increased binding. So. Yep. I have no idea. <laughs> must be, must be the key, you know. Must be the key force, you know. I have no idea. Chi, chi, right? Key. I kido. I do aikido, so it's the internal energy. Uh, key. <laughs> All right. So let's go then. So I told you um, how in fibromyalgia we saw these reductions in myopia receptor uh, binding that were related to clinical, <coughs> to clinical. Um, a presentation, particularly the affective element of pain. Um, and this was in fibromyalgia, which is system similar to what has been done or has been shown for other forms of chronic pain. Then we looked at another form of pain, which is a little bit more localized. And this is actually non-neuropathic back pain. Um, no, back pain is very common. Um, as you know, many people suffer from it. Um, equally, men and women, maybe a little bit more men. Um, and uh, so we looked at this as another form of pain that is very common to study its neurobiology. Uh, and in fact, it's one of the common conditions for which opioid analgesics are actually being prescribed. And con contrary. I was just thinking that, that, that those are the patients which get yeah. 
they get a lot of yeah, a lot a lot of those. Um, in fibromyalgia, is well known as well as in neuropathic pain that opiates don't work very well right. for them, and that's probably they have a profound reduction in myopia receptors. Both of them do. Al contrary to what we saw for fibromyalgia and has been shown for arth um, arthritic pain and neuropathic pain, um, individuals with low back pain actually saw an increase. We saw an increase in myopia receptor availability at baseline. Uh, in the thalamus, primarily. So the binding was up, contrary to other pain conditions. And in fact, uh, the more, um, the interesting part about this is the lower the binding, or the, actually, let's do it the opposite way, the higher the binding, the less the positive affect. So meaning that in this case, we may be in a situation where there is tone actually taking place because of this chronic pain condition. And individuals that actually had lower binding at baseline, they actually had better positive affect. They had better gray matter volumes, actually, in some of these regions, uh, in both the right thalamus and the left thalamus. So it seems like the people who had more binding were actually doing worse than people with low binding. So it's kind of reversed to what has been seen for other pain conditions. And in fact, when we actually looked at the release of endogenous opioids, we look at release under two different conditions. One of them was pain expectation. So we give them the isotonic saline. They expect pain, but they don't receive it. We actually see release of opioids in some areas when we do that. <clears throat> and another one uh, with the pain itself. And for both pain expectation and for actual pain itself, there was a reduction in the capacity to release endogenous opioids in these patients diagnosed with um, with neuropathic pain. So what may be going on is that you have a downregulation of receptors because of this uh, pain barrage over time, but potentially depletion of endogenous opioid peptides and no capacity to release opioids to adapt to environmental stimuli, like changes in the pain signal or even pain expectation, where release of opioids was reduced. And primarily this was actually taking place in the amygdala region, which is an area involved, as you know, in affective regulation, but also in pain regulation. And the uh, more the release of, the, the less capacity to release these endogenous opioids, the more the back pain intensity of these patients, and, um, and the less positive affect, or I can reverse it, simply say, the, um, if you release a lot of opioids, you, let me see, the less the release of opioids, the more the back pain intensity, and the, the less the release of opioids, the less the positive affect. So meaning that um, it's, it's a good mechanism. I think it, you know, I'm making it complicated here. All right. Yeah. Why, am I, why am I making it complicated? Yeah, I'm getting lost. Hold on a second. So, so I am releasing opioids. The less the release of opioids, the more the back pain intensity, sorry. And the more the release of opioids, the more the positive affect. OK? Got it? Okay, I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> got, got weird there. You can't have release of opiates all the time and have positive acts, so eventually that's going to... Yeah, that's, that's gonna, a good question. Yeah. Well, this is momentary, right? So yeah. basically what we are doing is a challenge. It's a challenge for 20 minutes, and the idea is at least that challenge is giving us a sense of what's the capacity to activate the system to change. So, but let's not forget dopamine, right? And how dopamine is also involved in these mechanisms. So we looked at dopamine, and similar to what, in fact, in this case, is similar to what has been shown for uh, illnesses like fibromyalgia. There is only one study that looked at dopamine D2 receptors uh, and release of dopamine in chronic pain. And this was done in fibromyalgia patients. Uh, this was done in Canada. And they saw reductions in binding and reductions in release. And we saw the same thing. So basically, we saw reductions in binding. Uh, in this case, it went in the opposite direction as the opioid system. The more the reduction in binding, the lower the binding at baseline, uh, the better the positive affect, and the better the pain tolerance. So dopamine seems to be going kind of in the opposite direction as the opioid system. And in fact, uh, when you look at release of dopamine in response to pain, um, uh, we saw that there was less overall release, although there was a fair amount of inter-individual variation. And uh, the, the less the release of dopamine, the more the capacity to activate the endogenous opioid system in response to the pain signal. Again, in the same direction as we were talking about before. 
which is if you have less dopaminergic stimulation, you have probably more preservation of endogenous opiate peptides in some brain regions, such as the amygdala, so terminal areas, and the better capacity to suppress pain. All right, so I'm almost done with this. So I'm giving you kind of the complexity story that is in the background <coughs> in terms of you know, potential for uh, opioid abuse, drug addiction among patients diagnosed with chronic pain and the function of the system. In this case, we looked at chronic non-neuropathic back pain patients, and we looked at cumulative doses of fentanyl. So we gave uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, and 0 0.3 <coughs> milligrams per kilogram every 30 minutes um, while patients were uh, being observed. And we did this in a group of controls and in a sample of patients diagnosed with chronic non-neuropathic back pain, not on opiates. These guys were not taking opiates. And we saw that basically there was the individuals, the controls uh, in blue, actually they plateaued early in terms of like the positive drug effects and they had more side effects, more uh, bad drug effects to the point where we actually only studied a few and we stopped doing the experiments because we were getting a lot of side effects in healthy controls at doses that the chronic pain patients were actually not experiencing much of a challenge. So um, they experienced in a manner proportional to those, both good drug effects with plateau at about 0.1 uh, milligrams per 70 kilograms um, um, for both uh, bad and good drug effects. And then they also uh, gave a value of the dose uh, in dollars, basically. They, they were asked to give value to the actual uh, experience. Uh, in dollars and the control, the, the controls gave a lesser value, they had less positive effects than the patients uh, in green and they plateaued about 0.1 milligrams uh, per 70 kilograms. When they, what, they, what we did then was compare this uh, good drug effect with the function of the myopia receptor uh, both at baseline, so meaning myopia receptor availability as well as the release of endogenous opioids in response to challenge. And there was actually a negative correlation. So meaning that the individual ratings for a given dose, the individual ratings of good drug effect were negatively correlated with myopia receptor availability. The, the, the more the binding, the less the good drug effect. Not unlike what has been seen with dopamine receptors, where if you were to administer cocaine, the lower the binding, the more the good drug effect, and the higher the binding, the more the side effects. So the effects were similar to what has been seen in cocaine uh, in both healthy controls and, and cocaine-dependent volunteers. And also we saw this with the capacity to release endogenous opioids, meaning that individuals that had the capacity to release more endogenous opioids had um, that were not on opiates, that the release more endogenous opiates had less of a good drug effect, meaning that if you have a good integrity of your endogenous opioid system, if you are able to activate the system in response to a challenge, in this case pain, you don't experience the fentanyl, a myopia receptor agonist, as being good or as giving you a good effect. So if you, the, we interpreted this as saying, well, if you have a well-functioning endogenous opioid system, you don't appreciate or you don't receive a good effect out of the fentanyl, your uh, mu opioid receptor agonist administered uh, peripherally. All right. So what do you mean by good opioid system? Good effect. Good, good, good function of the opioid system. So be, meaning that... Vmax or...? or uh, well, for mu opioid receptors, Vmax over KD. And, and the release of endogenous opioids in response to pain, meaning the capacity to release these peptides in response to the challenge. So the more the myopia receptors and the more the capacity to activate the system appropriately in response to pain, the less you need the myo agonist, kind of. That's basically the idea behind it. That's how we interpret that. And we also looked at the effect of opiates. This was in a sample <coughs> of 21 patients with chronic low back pain treated with opiates chronically compared to chronic low back pain not treated with opiates. And individuals that were treated with opiates, we actually saw, um, this was, the studies were done um, after the last dose of opiates the night before. So they were pretty much washed out from the system. And as you pretty much would expect, 
you saw reductions very localized in myopia receptor availability at baseline in the amygdala and nucleus accumbens for individuals treated with opiates in green. What was actually interesting about that, that in the same regions, in the accumbens region, ventral pallidum and amygdala, the individuals that were treated with opiates also had less capacity to release endogenous opioids in response to the pain challenge, meaning that the chronic, these were all people who were treated with opioids chronically. Not very high doses, most of them, um, and this was corrected for those in morphine equivalents. So the individuals that were actually treated with opiates actually seemed to have a more dysregulated, or the administration of opiates dysregulated more your endogenous opioid system, uh, meaning that um, probably the chronic opioid administration is not allowing your system potentially to actually function appropriately in response to pain. There's another explanation is uh -huh. that some of those receptors are inside the cell. That and, too. And your in, fentanyl will see those. In this case. Not the, uh, not in, the in this case, yes. I mean, did you would expect that that would be the case? Yeah. You carfentanil will see probably both intracellular and extracellular yeah. because it will penetrate the membrane like crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's very, you yeah. know. Yeah. So, so, so you could be measuring the difference between extracellular and intracellular? Probably, probably not. I think we measured everything. No, no, no. I mean, yeah. you, your difference yes. between your treatment and your non treated could be the difference between intracellular and extracellular. Right, uh, probably, is, uh, probably, on also <laughs> high affinity versus low affinity. High affinity, low affinity, exactly. Center, center, or yeah. Less or more. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I mean, no, no, less or more. I mean, in this case, in the case of release of endogenous opioids, when you are measuring the change, I mean, you are measuring the change acutely, so you know that you know whatever it is that you are doing is not going to be because of deep, you know, receptor internalization or destruction, because it's, it's an acute change. It's happening over twenty minutes. Yeah. But so that's going to happen in like two or three minutes and they're going to go in. But you're going to be measuring everything. The only thing that probably is going on at the same time for this particular tracer is that you are probably only measuring high affinity receptor sites because you are using an agonist ligand. Yeah. So it is possible that, you know, yes, there is some kind of turnover um, or that there are less available receptors for binding the endogenous ligand. So either way, it probably means that you have a less functional system. Yeah. So I may be mes less release or less capacity to activate. But either way, <coughs> it, measures, it, it tells you that the system is not working appropriately after chronic opioid administration, which makes sense. sense. Yeah, which makes sense. All right. So that's all I wanted to tell you. I mean, there's plenty of stuff to discuss. But basically, we see substantial inter-individual variation in the function of dopamine and opioid systems in healthy controls which we are tracing back to things like sex differences, inflammatory factors, homogenetic polymorphisms, um, persistent pain conditions such as neuropathic pain, I didn't tell you about this, but infibromyalgia, chronic low back pain do demonstrate different patterns of opioid system alterations, uh, which are relevant for you know, the effect of endogenous opioids, potential treatments, etc. Uh, the concentration of myopia receptors and the function of the endogenous opioid system appear to be relevant and inversely associated with the effect of opioid agonists. Uh, when given uh, acutely. And we seem to see that the chronic administration of opioids further dysregulates endogenous opioid mechanisms with reductions both at baseline receptor availability and the capacity to activate this transmitter system in response to both pain expectation and the pain signal. And that's all I want to tell you. Uh, whoa, what is that? OK, that's nothing. All right. And that's us, that's the group and our funding agencies. Thank you. No, ask me questions. So <laughs> yeah. a little bit of the whole question. Yeah. Uh, is in these studies, have, has anyone done cocaine or amphetamines for pain? Uh, no. What would you ex expect based on, on the, your work and what is it known that in case of acute neuropathic pain in the end of studies, there is a down regulation of dopaminergic signaling in the nucleus of the Yeah. Um, what we seem to see is that this dopamine, this reduction of dopamine D2 receptor seems to be uh, probably a good thing, maybe a compensatory phenomenon, to the extent that we do see um, an inverse association with the function of the endogenous opioid system. And in fact, the lower the binding, the lower the release of dopamine in response to the pain challenge, 
the better the clinical pain rating. So it seems to be a compensatory mechanism. That being said, there are actually clinical trials looking at dopamine agonists for chronic pain conditions with moderate success. There is also literature that speaks of dopamine D2 antagonists being utilized for chronic pain conditions. So it's a complex story. I mean, here we see more dopamine systems being, the reduction in the function of dopamine systems being kind of more of a compensatory phenomenon. It's, re it's reducing the saliency of the stimulus. Uh, it's increasing endogenous opioid peptides and the function of the endogenous opioid system. And it has a positive effect on clinical pain ratings. Um, so that's what we see here, which is somewhat counterintuitive from what some drug companies are doing right now, <coughs> which is using um, agonists, partial agonists and, direct, and, and full agonists for uh, chronic pain control. So, D2. D2. Mm. So you, you showed that estrogen modulated impulsivity. Mm -hmm. So does impulsivity go and, and opioid receptor um, availability? So does, does that occur through the menstrual cycle as well? Uh, we haven't looked at that. I mean, these measures are thoroughly trait-based. Um, we are talking about it, but we haven't looked at that yet. I mean, there are many forms of impulsivity, right? So, yeah, there are many forms of impulsivity, and that comes across in animal models, uh, depending on the animal yeah, model I that you that's use. A big problem with the field of yeah. impulsivity because some people are going to be impulsive for drinking, exactly. some sex. I, mean, you, you, I don't know how people measure impulsivity. It's, it's, very, controver it's very controversial. I mean, you have yeah. motor like impulsivity, like yeah. motoric impulsivity, you have uh, urgency like impulsivity, you know, in terms of. You know, you, there are many, many forms, and that actually is also reflected in the animal models, the sign trackers versus the gold trackers. Yeah. You know, what the hell is that? I mean, I don't know what it is. I mean, it refers to what, motor impulsivity? I don't know. I'm probably a gold tracker. No, no, I'm, I'm a sign tracker. I like motorcycles and, surf, and surfing. Actually, it depends what, <laughs> what I'm doing with it. Exactly. So <laughs> there are many forms of impulsivity, and I think it's, yeah. it's hard to actually define that. No, I mean, no, no. I've, I've, always, I've always complained about that. Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I'll jump up a bridge, but when it comes to taking the drug, I'm much more right. conservative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and I may drive fast, but, you know, I don't do other things. So, I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it, <laughs> yeah, yeah you're the same way. You, yeah. you, you go surfing in big waves, and, mm -hmm. but yeah. you, you, you know, risk-taking it the same way. It's a diff yeah, you're right. I mean, and, and that is reflected by the complexity, I think, of the system. Some things may be more related to, you know, the opioid system. I think, in general, you tend to think of the opioid system as being more appetitive. It's the liking thing. You know, it's suppression of fear, the capacity to adapt to a stressor, or even enjoying things like are related to stress. <coughs> While the dopamine system is responding generally to salient type of I, stimuli. I, I actually have a different view. I, I've always thought that, that it's more responsive I don't think so. No, we've done that like 15 different ways. Um, one that was actually interesting recently, we used a, uh, a social rejection model. Yeah. So you do like a dating game in the computer yeah. and where you basically rate um, individual profiles of the favorite sex, yeah. uh, of your favorite sex, and then those people rate you back. Of course, it's fake. It's not real, so right? Crazy, yeah. So it's, it's fake. But so we do it fakely. But people do get very upset, right? <laughs> and it's like, you know, I was, you know, beautiful guy or you know, gorgeous guy or beautiful women, and they are rejecting me all over the place. And um, and they release when you do that, you release endogenous opioids like crazy. And the more you release endogenous opioids, the better the suppression of that negative experience. So you suppress that negative experience better. You also, when you get uh, accepted, you also release endogenous opioids in different brain regions, particularly the accumbens. And in that one, it's associated with like the pleasure of the acceptance, yeah. you know, yeah. among these individuals. So it has the opioid system ha has that yin yang thing going on. Yeah. So in some areas, it's appetitive, like the pallidum region, for example, accumbens. Some areas is suppressive of a negative affect. It's still going in the, in the right direction, which is a stress suppression but also pleasure in some areas. Unless it's dynorphin, it could be aggressive. Right, but and in this case with the mu, you are talking encephalins, endomorphins, and beta endorphin. Well, I don't know if that's always true. Because, I mean, the proto can produce some very high affinity um, mu locates yeah. and delta 
but it's unfortunately, unfortunately, they're freaking complicated systems. It's very complicated. System. <laughs> it's a very complicated. That's why we don't talk about the spe specific peptides because I mean most of them start that we are measuring. Yeah, exactly. Because most of the stuff that we are measuring probably is encephalinergic. I mean, yeah. some beta endorphin, but mostly encephalinergic. Well, the, the other thing is that we were just talking about this yogurt system in the, in the rats and the mice are totally different from the human. Don't because tell me that. The distribution of receptors. Oh, it geez. is. Well, we if you look in the psyche. Yeah. Oh, jeez. Now you are making more complicated for me. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, do, yeah. I, I, you don't have the resolution to see if there's a, a, a patch like system. No. No, no. Be, it looks pretty homogeneous whenever I've seen. Yeah, it is homogeneous. You have, uh, it's not like, a there is more of a patch-like distribution in the dorsal area of the basal ganglia, like the cow dead yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a little bit more diffuse. It's much more concentrated in the accumbens. It's very dense in the accumbens, particularly in the cell region. Yes. Heavily. Uh, it's very, very dense. So, yeah. You, yeah. <laughs> Is, is, is people think it's protective, yeah. yeah. Most people think it's protective, that there is a lesser, uh, that individuals with chronic pain, uh, maybe because to some extent, you know, they, because they use these for treatment, they probably don't have the same, well, you know, motivation sick, the, the, the motivation the is the pain, it's not the pleasure. Well, the, the reinforcement is positive because you are, you know, pain is going down, you feel better, right? But, you, but yeah, 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 but that's but negative, but reinforcement. negative reinforcement. Right, it right. No, you're right. It's the right. psychological it's element is different. Mm -hmm. But the animal studies show that there's an enhancement of morphine reinforcement and morphine preference in chronic pain, yes. neuropathic pain. Uh -huh. Yeah, but the dopamine release is, the dopamine system is totally... Totally down. Yeah, the pain becomes the the thing to do, uh, the, the, the thing to do. Thing yeah, as opposed to it, it takes a salient, it takes the takes the salience uh, that otherwise you know would be on other things. So it becomes salient, and that's people develop the so-called pseudo addictions, right? I mean, where you want the medication, make sure you have the medication on time, but you're not necessarily addicted. You don't take it for pleasure. You don't. Although some people get in trouble. I mean, uh, probably. The statistics say maybe 12 percent of patients with chronic pain conditions do develop a true dependence on the opioids and eventually escalate doses and get in trouble so the question really is trying to identify those subjects and to understand what drives the whole thing i mean again some of these studies to try to differentiate chronic pain conditions go in that direction so try to understand a little bit of the this inter-individual variation and there is there are differences between neuropathic pain and other forms of pain so Well, part. Twelve percent of people who drink alcohol get really addicted. Mm. It's actually against the, the, um, the notion that pain actually might be. Right. You're talking about general population. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Talking yeah. about the, the yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
if you take all the population that use uh, nicotine are they're all addicted. So it's a little bit different, right? It's a little bit different. Not quite true. But <laughs> Not for nicotine. Uh, 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 but for nicotine, pe nicotine users uh, is one of the drugs with highest retention, right? 70%, 75%. There are few people who are able to kind of smoke occasionally, relatively. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, Imaging. that one? Uh, <laughs> no, I didn't present it. <laughs> I think I, it was kind of long already, so I, I kept it on the pain piece. This was um, a series of studies where we looked at, well, we've done two sets of studies where we genotype for the mu receptor polymorphism, the A11AG. One of them was in nicotine-dependent volunteers, and another one was in um, healthy controls uh, during pain, at baseline, during pain, and during placebo administration, okay? So what we saw consistently was that individuals that were either nicotine users or healthy controls, the G allele was associated with much less mu, with many less mu opioid receptors uh, throughout the brain. So basically, there were large reductions, 20, 30% average, uh, throughout the brain, thalamus nucleus accumbens, subgenual cingulate, dorsal cingulate, all over the place. There were large reductions in the availability of receptors, which is consistent with the more recent literature in terms so of. Do you ever find a homozygote? Uh, no, well, uh, we have a few, yeah. Wait, yeah. Wait, wait. yeah. More receptors? Or less. Receptors? A lot less. The G allele. Less. Which is consistent with the more modern data, the more recent data on this, where there was less mRNA expression in G allele carriers. Yes, correct. So it's a loss of function allele. And then when we looked at this, we actually looked at dopamine too. Um, with dopamine, we, don't see, we didn't see effects on binding for dopamine, but uh, the A alleles, so the, it's the opposite. The A alleles, compared to the G carriers, had less dopamine responses during pain. So the G carriers had more dopamine response to the stressor, okay? And when we looked at this during um, myopia receptors, we saw no effect during pain, but we saw an effect during placebo administration. So when you give a placebo, the A homozygotes, the AA homozygotes compared to the G carriers, which is the lesser frequent, had more placebo-induced myopia activation and dopamine D2 activation uh, during placebo. So basically, when you give a reward or a potential reward, which is the placebo, the A homozygous compared, compared to the G carriers release more dopamine and release more endogenous opioids. Um, and uh, the G, um, the G allele carriers showed um, more depression scores and more vulnerability scores neo vulnerability than the uh, G allele, the, than the A allele carriers. So there was more, seemed to be like a more vulnerable yeah. phenotype. Um, binding was much lower for both dopamine and mu receptors in the G allele carriers than the A allele carriers. Uh -huh. terminus of the receptor. Okay. And if you're having a different end terminus, it is quite likely that the insertion of the receptor in the membrane, you need to be correctly presented to the outside, is lower. So okay. this would decrease the function mm -hmm. of the receptor. So that seems to be consistent with what we see. A less of function version. So you have homozygotes you have homozygous for, for the for the G allele? For the for the G and the A. Yes. But we only had like in this sample, maybe like three homozygotes. I'm just wondering if there's any receptors there at all. Um, no, it's proportional. So you see linear relationship between, between them, yeah. 
So GG is the lowest, uh, G uh, heterozygous, intermediate, and AA uh, the highest. So AA has the disparity. Yeah. Yes, uh, yeah, AA is the classification. Yes. Is there, just on the same note, is there any other differences other than trafficking of the G allele, or is it like properties of the receptors themselves, or is it just? I mean, in this case, we only have two measures, right? We have a measure that relates to availability of receptors at baseline, and another one, the capacity to kind of activate the, the system in response to a challenge. We didn't see very much for pain. We saw challenges related to reward, like placebo administration, with expectation of improvement. Uh, we are following up on that a little bit more. We saw the same thing with, um, with nicotine-dependent volunteers uh, in that the G allele were also the ones with less binding. They also released more dopamine, and uh, there was actually more release of endogenous opioids in response to nicotine administration. Again, the sample sizes are small, but that is being shown in a couple of different uh, studies already. But even, so. even on a more like, basic level, is it less activity overall because the change in the end term is it's thought to be a loss of function, a loss of function uh, allele, yeah. Yeah. yeah, there is a lot of arguments. It's been very controversial. I think it's, yeah, I think it's pretty much decided that that's kind of the thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is evidence. I didn't put the references, the slide of references, but I can send them to you and I actually have them. That paper is published. There are two papers on that. Uh, if you look up my name real quick on PubMed, you'll see, and you cross reference with MPY, there are two papers, one in Nature that did the original description, and in that one, um, and then another one in the Archives of General Psychiatry right after in 2009 or 10. Um, that had references for uh, evidence of neuropeptide Y acting, some of the effects of neuropeptide Y in terms of stress suppression taking place because of interaction with <coughs> opioidergic cells, no? in that um, you can block them with naloxone or naltrexone in animal models. So there, I have the references there. You can just cross reference it real quick. Neuropeptide Y, my name, and comes out. So there are two papers on that. Mm -hmm. Are we done? Okay. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.